Thank you. The next item of business is a statement by Keith Brown on Scottish Government response to independent review of deaths in prison custody. The Cabinet Secretary will take questions at the end of his statement, and so there should be no interventions or interruptions. I call on Keith Brown, Cabinet Secretary, around 10 minutes, please. Hey, thank you, President Officer. In November 2019, my predecessor asked Her Majesty's Chief Inspector of Prisons for Scotland and her co-chairs, Professor Nancy Lauks, Chief Executive of Families Outside, and Judith Robertson, Chair of Scottish Human Rights Commission, to carry out an independent review into the response to deaths in custody in recognition of the need for increased transparency and better engagement with families following a death in custody. That review is now complete and has published today. I would like to take this opportunity to make a statement to highlight this important work and set out the context of the review and its findings. And members will now have the opportunity to consider and read the report. Before I do so, however, I must offer my sincere condolences to all those who have lost loved ones while in prison custody. It is always hard to lose someone close to you, but to do so in circumstances where you cannot be with them and may not be clear about the circumstances of their death must be especially hard to bear. I am also very grateful to Her Majesty's Chief Inspector of Prisons, Wendy Sinclair Gibbon, and her co chairs, Professor Nancy Lauks and Judith Robertson, who worked with her to conduct the review for the comprehensive and robust work they have carried out. Families outside facilitated the involvement of families who have been bereaved by a death in custody, and the Commission provided expertise on human rights. I know that delivering the review took longer than had originally been planned, but this was unavoidable in light of the impact of the COVID pandemic. I would like to thank all concerned for their commitment to the review through challenging circumstances and the very real barriers that COVID imposed on the research process. The primary aim of the review is to make recommendations on areas in which improvements could be made in the immediate response to deaths in prison custody by both the Scottish Prison Service and the NHS, including deaths of prisoners whilst in NHS care. Most importantly, the review aims to highlight ways that, in the event of a death in custody, the response to and experience of families could be standardised and improved, so as to provide prompt answers, transparency and, importantly, compassion. I should highlight at the outset that it is not the purpose of this review to include or consider the investigation of deaths in prison. The Lord Advocate is the independent head of the system for the investigation of sudden and suspicious deaths, and the Crown Office and Fiscal System carry out that work on her behalf. As such, the investigation of deaths occurring in prison, including criminal investigations and arrangements for fatal accident inquiries, are out with the remit of the review. In Scotland, the Fatal Accident Inquiry, or FEI, is mandatory whenever someone has died in prison custody, and the Crown Office undertakes independent investigations in advance of mandatory FEIs. I am grateful, as I have said, to the management and staff at the Scottish Prison Service and in the NHS for engaging with the review and for informing its recommendations. The review makes a number of important recommendations, highlighting practical, operational and compassionate changes that are needed to improve the ways that deaths in prison custody are handled and responded to in Scotland by both the Prison Service and the NHS. These changes include training grounded in the appreciation of the impact of death, as well as early empathetic engagement with families. We will work with the SPS and healthcare delivery partners to ensure that these recommendations are delivered. I know that SPS have already implemented some immediate improvements, such as compiling a booklet which signposts families to bereavement services and to support. And I look forward to seeing more of the changes that will be implemented in the coming months. So can I put on record my own appreciation for the SPS and prison-based NHS staff who care for some of the most vulnerable people in our society, as I saw it firsthand when I visited Perth Prison earlier this month. The overwhelming majority of staff are extremely committed to ensuring the health and well-being of the people they care for, and they want to do the right thing with regards to their loved ones. It is clear that while systemic and operational changes are needed, particularly in standardising an improved response in the event of a death, there are and there have been very real efforts by staff to support one another, as well as the prisoners who are impacted by a death. Most of all, I would like to express my gratitude to the families who either participated in the research process or who formed the Family Advisory Group. I understand that the advisory group met monthly for the duration of the review, providing lived experience and expert views on the issues they looked at. 
and I am very aware that their involvement over such an extended time period may have required a great deal of emotional resilience. And I thank them for their time, their willingness to revisit the grief they experienced and the insights they gained through their participation. Turning to the report itself, the law officers and I met last Thursday with the chairs of the review to discuss their findings and recommendations. While I, of course, have not yet had the opportunity to fully consider the detail and implications of all the findings and recommendations made by the review, I wanted to be clear to Parliament that I accept the recommendations in principle. In respect of the key recommendation, I agree that an independent body should carry out an investigation into every death in custody. The recommendation is that an independent investigatory body, which immediately starts a process of engaging with the family and agencies, could provide transparent and prompt information to families at an early stage, thus better meeting the needs of bereaved families. Families want to know as quickly as possible how their loved ones died and what the circumstances of their deaths were. This would complement the independent investigation by the Crown Office into the circumstances of the death, the information provided to families by the Crown Office in terms of the Family Liaison Charter and the subsequent FEI, which is provided, presided over by the judiciary. I should highlight at this stage that it is clear that the suggested recommendation around this independent body does not and should not replace any of the current inquiry processes. The current FEI process, as enacted in legislation in 2016, follows upon an in-depth review of the FEI system. There have been improvements in relation to the system of FEIs since the introduction of the legislation and the modernisation project undertaken by the Crown Office in 2019, and that will be further enhanced by a specialist Crown Office team that will focus on the investigation of deaths in custody and the resulting FEIs and brings together a number of specialist disciplines. This recommendation will, of course, require some further detailed practical and legal consideration in conjunction with the Crown Office and Fiscal Service and other partners. And that will take time, but I commit to doing so as quickly as possible. Overall, the findings point to a lack of consistency in the way that deaths in custody, and specifically the engagement with the family by the prison service in the event of a death, are handled. Indeed, while the experience of families in the way that they are consulted and considered varies, at present, this engagement tends to lack the compassion that we might expect. And I believe emphatically that this does not represent a lack of compassion or humanity on the part of the prison service. Rather, this points to the need for staff training and how to have difficult conversations and knowing what information they can share and when. Conversations, as we know, about death are never easy and they require maturity, sensitivity and empathy. Staff can be coached to enable them to hold these conversations in ways that uphold the dignity of bereaved families, whilst also providing them with valuable answers and support. I was also pleased to note that the review acknowledges the good practice that does exist, such as meetings held with families which struck a sensitive tone, invitations to families to visit the establishment and see where their loved one lived for context, inclusion of the family also in memorial services and facilitating their meeting friends and cellmates. I have been told that the review team heard examples of sensitive and supportive staff. I note too that this was not universally the case, and I accept that, uh, and that through trauma-informed training, as I mentioned earlier, and a review of operational processes, what is an extremely difficult time for bereaved families could be made less traumatic and more compassionate. And I want to reiterate that I am committed to improving the immediate response to bereaved families who have lost a loved one while they were in prison custody. I should also mention it is out with the scope of this review, but I have also raised the issue of the notification of victims in the event of a death in custody. I am aware that this service is already provided by the Victim Notification Scheme, and it will be subject to a review in its own right next year. I, along with relevant key partner agencies, will hold a roundtable at the beginning of next year to map out what needs to be done to deliver on the new review's recommendations and progress work to make the necessary changes to operations. This review is a substantial one, and we will work on the recommendations and advisory points set out by the Chief Inspector and her co-chairs. Our ultimate aim is to improve the ways that deaths of loved ones in prison custody are experienced by bereaved families. As a progressive society, it is important that we have transparency, a trauma-informed approach, and a compassionate justice system that understands that improvements need to be made to better deliver for families. And finally, I commit to presenting officer to giving Parliament a full update of progress by summer 2022. Thank you.
Thank you. The Cabinet Secretary will now take questions on the issues raised in his statement, and I intend to allow around 20 minutes for questions, after which time we will have to move on to the next item of business. It would be helpful if members who wish to ask a question were to press the request to speak buttons now, and I call Jamie Green. Thank you. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his statement, but also to the review group for their work, and can I say to the families of anyone who uh, whose relative died in custody, that we share your grief here today. Uh, the best way to summarise this rather stark report is on the front page of it. It says, two pillars of trauma-informed practice are choice and control. Our review showed that clearly that families bereaved through a death in custody have neither. This report paints a grim picture of systemic failings in how we deal with and prevent deaths in custody, many of which go unknown and unnoticed, those with mental health problems who died of suicide or drug overdoses in our prisons, the silent victims of our justice system, 39 of them so far this year, and their families have been let down on so many levels so many times. Most worryingly, worryingly of all, though, Cabinet Secretary, this report says that little has been done right now to learn lessons and prevent future deaths, and I hope that this report is a real wake-up call and a catalyst for change. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary, given that the main recommendations for an independent new body to oversee investigations into deaths in custody, how will this remove, uh, augment or duplicate work which is the current remit of the Crown and existing uh, bodies? If legislation is needed for its creation, how forthcoming will that legislation be? Will he finally now back our repeated calls for a statutory time frame uh, for fatal accident inquiries, as the report itself now also calls for. And given the stark seriousness of the situation, which of the report's recommendations can be acted on straight away so that even just one life could potentially be saved as a result of this report? Cabinet Secretary. Can I thank uh, Jamie Green for his uh, questions and trying to uh, address them in turn. First of all, he mentioned how important it was for the prison service and others to learn the lessons. And I think that's one of the trenchant criticisms in the report, that although it might be the case that an individual death in custody has led to the learning of lessons, it's not cumulatively done. We don't bank that learning for future. And I think the establishment of an independent body may be one way in which we can ensure that that happens. There are other recommendations, as Jamie Green will know in the report, that should ensure that does happen. We have to learn continuously and not forget lessons which have previously been learned. So I do take that point uh, on board. Uh, he's asked about uh, the independent body, and in particular, how would it fit into the other um, bodies which are involved necessarily uh, after a death in custody, and that's an important point. All I would say is that in the discussions which I had with both the authors of the report and the law officers last week, we've all acknowledged there is going to be, have to be substantial work involving the Crown Office, involving the Lord Advocate and various other bodies to make sure this can fit properly, because we cannot allow any system to prejudice a criminal report or undermine the Lord Advocate's constitutional position in relation to FEI. So that is a real concern, and I can't answer it just now. All I would say is that those discussions will take place, and we will make sure that one does not uh, trip over the other. And on his point about um, speed, I, I very much take that point. It's been a criticism, obviously, uh, in relation to FEIs as well. And to see the report mentioned that these reports should come out within months, and they say that very specifically. Uh, I certainly agree with that. And so the actions I will take between now and when I come back to Parliament to report on this will be to make sure we do not lose sight of the need for a quick response to the families. And both in terms of the communications and the quickness of response, perhaps these are two of the top three asks of families in this circumstance, so we have to do that. It will only, though, be at the point when we do have the chance to look further into the um, uh, report's findings and have those discussions with, with other partners whether we'll be able to watch out, whether we'll be able to tell whether further legislation is required. And as I've said, I'm happy to come back to Parliament and report on that in due course. Polly McNeill. Thank you, thank you, Cabinet Secretary, for the chance to question this important area of policy. The report is damning on Scotland's approach to death in custody, and the report states things like prison officials accused of corporate homicide for their failures in an investigation of death. To name but a few, Alan Marshall, whose families do not feel he have the answers, William and Lindsay Brown, and Katie Arnley, 
Allen, whose family still await a fatal accident inquiry. The report goes on to say um, that the prison, Scottish Prison Service are seeking to limit accountability, a lack of family engagement in every step of the journey. Humanity and compassion at times were compromised. Cabinet Secretary will know that evidence shows that the involvement of families in fatal accident inquiries and investigations does make a huge difference to the outcome in terms of the recommendations. Does the Cabinet Secretary believe that this independent body should have unfettered access to all relevant material, including the data, and that there should be a duty on the Scottish Prison Service to retain all relevant information, as the report says? The Cabinet Secretary has already responded to Jamie Green's question, so you have answered that, which is, can this have the ability to shorten the time it will take to get answers, and you've said, I think, yes, it could have. Finally, they want to ask, does the Cabinet Secretary believe, in order to change the direction of these horrendous figures that, and the way that families are treated, that this body must be given unfettered access to provide these answers, the answers that families need to have? Cabinet Secretary. Hey, can I thank Polly McNeill for her questions? And I can't immediately think of any reason why a body shouldn't have those powers, unless there is something that comes up during the discussion with other partners, which is comp a compelling reason not to do that. I can't think of why we should want to fetter um, this independent body. It's independent for a reason. And also, you'll see that other recommendations do refer to data and information being provided more readily, for example, to uh, families. So why we do not provide that information to this independent body, it would seem uh, wrong not to do that. I think just to mention, as I say, we'll have to have those discussions with our partners. We'll come back to Parliament, and Parliament will have its say, of course, on that. But the other points which uh, Paul McNeill uh, makes are really uh, important, and they can be sometimes lost. The ability to be informed and the ability to be spoken to in a way that understands the impact of somebody's death. And I don't blame the prison service for that. I think across the justice system, people are doing a job, and they don't see it as central to that job necessarily to have that trauma-informed approach, which is necessary for us to try and embed right across the system. They're doing their job, uh, but I think it's important now that we say there's more to it than that. And when we're dealing with people who have um, lost somebody who's uh, died through a death in, in custody, we have to make sure they get the right information, as much information as they can, that they're spoken to in a way that understands the loss that they, they've experienced, and, crucially, that we get those answers in a quick fashion. Now, I can't say for certain that there wouldn't be a case for some reason didn't take longer than a year, but I think if the if the um, standard is to be a matter of months, and not necessarily 10, 11 months, but a matter of months, that would be much better for the families. So this is a serious attempt by this uh, report to try and address some of these fundamental concerns. Thank you. I, I would just um, ask for succinct questions and answers. We've used up over seven minutes of the 20 minutes available for two questioners, and I really don't want to prejudice all the backbenchers who wish to ask questions. Next question, Rona Mackay. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Cabinet Secretary mentioned the importance of ensuring that staff are well trained in the way that deaths in custody and the engagement with families in the event of death should be handled. Can the Cabinet Secretary say any more about what can be done to ensure that staff are trained to hold such conversations sensitively whilst providing the answers and support that they require? Cabinet Secretary. Just to be brief, the review makes, um, as Rona Mackay points out, a number of important recommendations highlighting practical, operational and compassionate changes that are needed to improve the ways that deaths in prison custody are handled and responded to by the prison service, the NHS and others. And that will require, as the report suggests, and as Rona Mackay hints, uh, training on their part. So we will work with the prison service, the NHS and Crown Office to make sure that these changes are made. Russell Finlay. Thank you. Uh, against a backdrop of rising prison deaths, families tell the report's author the authorities often don't care about the death of addicts. The Cabinet Secretary has committed to ending drug-soaked prison mail, which will save lives. But can he tell us exactly when that will happen? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, in terms of the laying of the statutory instrument, that was laid today with the Parliament. Uh, if it goes, and it depends on parliamentary scrutiny, as a member will be, will be aware, but if it goes, uh, as we hope it will do, then that should be coming into effect on the 13th of December. I call Audrey Nicholl to be followed by Katie Clark. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can the Cabinet Secretary provide any further information as to how the voices of families of prisoners, as well as human rights experts, have been represented throughout the review process? Cabinet Secretary. 
Well, as I say, Member Hintz, it would have been wholly wrong to have had such a review without involving the families. So I've already mentioned the family advisory group was set up. It met monthly for the duration of the review, made up of 12 people from eight families, uh, and it informed the work of the review throughout by providing lived experience. And the helpline team from families outside also collated inquiries for families regarding concern for someone in prison. Uh, Judith Robertson, chair of the Scottish Human Rights Commission, was appointed as co-chair of the review. And just to um, reassure the member that we will make sure that the involvement of families continues as we uh, look through the report's uh, recommendations and take them forward. I call Katie Clark to be followed by Gordon MacDonald. The Cabinet Secretary said he agrees in principle with a key recommendation of the report that a separate independent investigation should be undertaken into each death in custody. Would he also agree that as part of this, it is vital that an independent investigator has early access to all witnesses whilst events are still fresh in their minds? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, uh, can I thank the member for the question and say that's why I've said in principle, because I think in practice she will know better than me perhaps that there are dangers in relation to that in terms of a possible criminal um, prosecution or an FAI. So there's a lot of work to, to be done to make sure those that are carrying out those inquiries, this independent um, uh, uh, body, make sure that they are not going to do that, jeopardise any future potential criminal case by making sure when they do talk to witnesses that they do so in such a way that doesn't make that um, process um, or uh, impinge on that process. But the ability to get into a situation quickly, provide the facts to the families is very important, and that will be the thrust of what we're trying to do. But some of these issues do have to be worked through, and that's why we need more time. Gordon MacDonald, to be followed by Liam MacArthur. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I met with the Governor of Shorts Prison last week concerning a constituent's relative who died while serving a prison sentence. His relatives don't want another family to face the outcome that they did. Can the Cabinet Secretary advise what steps are now being taken to reduce the number of drug-related deaths in prison custody and also how improved data transparency on deaths in custody will help families find closure? Cabinet Secretary. Just to confirm for the members, as I have said in response to Russell Finlay, an SSI is being laid, I hope, in Parliament today, which amends the prison rules to allow prison officers or employees to copy and for the purposes of investigating whether general correspondence received into a prison contains a prohibited article or unauthorised property to test that correspondence. And as I say, my hope is that subject to parliamentary scrutiny, it will come into force on the 13th of December. Liam MacArthur to be followed by Colette Stevenson. Thank you. Can I uh, thank the authors of the report but also pay credit to the families who have dragged the government to this point, determined to secure change for others because of the pain that they endured? Does the Justice Secretary acknowledge that a number of the lessons of this report, such as the need for learning to prevent more deaths, for investigations to happen quickly, for families to be kept updated, also apply to FAIs, which continue to routinely compound the pain of families and which ministers deliberately excluded from this review? Secretary. I may have misheard the member. I didn't catch the question that was in there, but the point he makes about, yes, this was, this was about the prison service's response and the NHS's response to death in custody. Overriding that is the ability of the Lord Advocate. Um, well, she, there's a mandatory FAI when there's death in custody. So that, um, that process, which was not the subject of this review, but which has been introduced um, by uh, Mr MacArthur, uh, I should say, is one which has been reviewed by this Parliament, has been agreed. I have still yet to see, although there are objections to it, and I do listen to those objections and some of the concerns, some of which have just been raised by Mr MacArthur. I have not yet seen uh, an alternative proposal being put forward in relation to that. Happy to listen to that, but in the meantime, I think this is taking forward the, what the SPS and the NHS can do into deaths in custody when people are in their care. Colette Stevenson to be followed by Maggie Chapman. Thank you, President Officer. Can the Cabinet Secretary provide any further information in terms of the steps being taken to provide mental health support to people in prisons to help mitigate against suicide? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I should say that uh, the frontline prison officers and NHS staff work hard every day to support people in custody, including those who use challenging behaviours as a means to communicate their distress. And we know that people in custody present higher levels of risk and vulnerability than the general population as a whole. So our Mental Health Transition and Recovery Plan, published in October 2020, made clear our commitment to continue to work with partners to seek better support for those with mental ill health within the criminal justice system, including prisons. And a cross-portfolio ministerial working group has been formed to identify the current issues faced in the justice system in relation to mental health and to look at ways to bring forward urgent and creative solutions to these issues. Maggie Chapman to be followed by Brian Whittle. 
I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his statement and echo his thanks to the review's co-chairs and everyone who supported its work, especially the families of those who have, the, the families who have lost loved ones in custody, and I extend my sympathies to them all. The review highlights that despite their best efforts, they experienced challenges in securing the participation of prison staff and had no control around ensuring randomised selection of participants and informed consent. Similarly, no women in custody participated. Both of these should be a cause for significant concern, perhaps the latter especially given recent and forthcoming discussions about gender inequalities in our institutions. Can the Cabinet Secretary outline what additional information and research he thinks is necessary to ensure we better understand the experiences and views of women in custody, as well as the prison staff who support them? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, I should say that the process which I have outlined earlier about taking this forward in discussions with other partners, those partners in the main will be listening to this debate and they will take on board some of the suggestions about additional information that might be required to make sure we get to the right um, solutions. And the member is quite right to mention the fact that prison staff in this context need training. It is fair enough to say prison staff should do this, that and the other, but they have to be trained to do that and have mentioned the difficult conversations that they have to have. But you are right to say that they must, the member is right to say that they must be trained and supported in doing that to make sure the families are kept aware, to make sure that other prisoners are also um, considered in terms of a death when it's happened. Uh, and it's to be a much more trauma-informed approach. Now, we can't just say people should do that. We have to take responsibility for training them, and we will do that. And as to the other lessons that we have to learn or other information that we have to call on, that will happen in the course of the next few months. Brian Whittle to be followed by James Dornan. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presenting Officer. Uh, one of uh, the prison staff members said that their participation in a fatal accident inquiry cannot be prepared for and is the single, most, single worst experience of a prison staff's role. So what is the Scottish Government doing to support our hard-working prison staff, both in ensuring they have access to mental health support services and support them when they have uh, participating in a fatal accident inquiry? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, the fatal accident inquiry, as I've mentioned, is not, uh, or the, the holding of it, is not within the gift of the Scottish Government. It's conducted by um, the Lord Advocate. But the member is quite right to raise the fact that there are staff that have been involved in that that require uh, support. And this report also recognises that. So I think I would just accept what the member says is that we have to do more in relation to this. I mentioned the impact on other prisoners of a death in custody. There is an impact on the staff as well, and we have to acknowledge that. So uh, the point is well taken. I think the support tries to address this, and the challenge for us now is to take that forward and try and deal with it as most effectively as we can. And I now call James Dornan, our last questioner, who is joining us remotely. Mr Dornan, please. Sir. Will be taken so, forward uh, excuse regarding me, Mr. Mr. Dornan, sorry, I'm, I, I'm sorry. There was a technical problem, so could you start your question again, please? Thank you. I certainly could. Can the Cabinet Secretary advise how the views and experiences of families will inform the work that will be taken forward regarding the recommendations of this review? Cabinet Secretary. Hey, can I thank James Dornan for his question? I've partially answered it earlier on, but he asked if it's going to be taken forward and just say that we'll be holding a round table early next year to inform next steps for progressing the review's recommendations. And for my part, I'm very open to discussion with the Chief Inspector of Prisons and families outside who have mentioned on how best the views of families and the Family Advisory Board can be heard at the round table and also how they can help inform and shape the progress of the recommendations. We will not get to the place we need to be if we do not have that input from the people most affected. By this. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. That concludes the statement. And there will be a very short pause to allow front benchers to uh, move to their seats safely before I call the next item of business. Thank you.